morning, everybody, and uh, glad to see that you survived the weather last night. And uh, at my house, my wife has uh, bad allergies, and uh, I was talking to somebody this morning. I think is the uh, Donna me is probably that sand from Sahara. They said that was blowing in. I don't know, but uh, uh, we're not talking about the Middle East or North Africa this morning. So I guess I'll move on from that. But um, it's been great to be here for these uh, five weeks. So this is my last week. If you're uh, uh, cheering for that or. Uh, lamenting one way or another. but uh, So this week we're uh, going to talk about Eastern religions. Um, part of this is I mixed uh, for time-wise. We didn't have enough time to separate these out. Part of this is uh, my experience is less uh, direct with these, <clears throat> but there are some common elements that hold together Buddhism and Hinduism, and so we'll talk about that this week. Uh, but before we get there, I want to uh, give just a, a broad overview, since we have talked about these different religions around the world, where does this situate Christianity? I think actually in the advertising, maybe when I agreed to do this with Sue, so that I would do a little bit more Christian theology and things, and uh, for the sake of time, that was uh, hard to, to get that side of it in, but I did want to uh, just give some basic stats here then of how these religions stack up with one another in a number of people, and then also distribution around the world. And so you'll see here, right, that uh, Christianity is at 2.4 billion, give or take, right? These are always rounded numbers. And it, of course, this is by nominal adherence, right? So uh, is it the people that go to church once a week? Uh, I think now sociologists count if you go to church at least once a month, uh, you know, as an active person. Um, so these different versions of these numbers are, are always a little bit squirrely, but they're, all of them are squirrely, so they're equally squirrely with one another, I guess is what we would say. And so um, the interesting thing about Christianity then is it's followed up by um, <clears throat> Islam, but their projections, the birth rate in Islamic countries uh, is still hi is higher than it is in Christian countries. So if you think of like Spain and Italy, the, the birth rate there is what, uh, at 1.0 and you had to have to be at 2.2 or whatever is the birth rate to have a replacement rate. And so those Christian countries are losing population uh, and then other, other industrialized parts of the world. And so that the Middle East actually uh, will rival Europe in population by 2050, 2075, because if birth rates maintain what they are. Uh, and so the Islam, uh, just for that purpose alone, is set to uh, become equal to Christianity um, if we're just following natural trend rates there. Uh, today, right, we're going to talk about uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, Hinduism, much larger because it's in the Indian subcontinent. And even though Buddhism started in India, uh, it's the one country in Asia and Southeast Asia that has hardly any Buddhist in it, uh, and, and because it's, uh, I guess Hinduism was so entrenched that Buddhism, once it moved out, uh, moved into Southeast Asia, so China, Vietnam, uh, those parts as well, uh, but didn't gain a groundhold in India. And so it has about half a million people there, right? So, or half a billion. One of the things that I want to show is this uh, map of the distribution of different uh, religious groups, right? So you have, uh, of course, North and South America are predominantly Christian. Now, again, what does Christianity look like here versus South America or the Caribbean, right? These are, Christianity is very diverse in these areas. So this singular color here uh, is a bit uh, misleading, but it also gives some of the bigger picture. Of course, we see Islam there in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, that 1.2 billion people of Hindus are just in the Indian subcontinent, right? I mean, so if we think about the amount of space in which such a large number of people are, uh, it, it spells that out, points that out. In fact, the half a million then that we get for it, uh, Buddhism is there where we see Myanmar uh, and Vietnam and, and those parts. Now, China, they have in purple here because technically the Chinese, like with a communist, they're unaffiliated, although uh, Chinese 
religion uh, is often a mixture of Buddhism. In fact, one of the two or three of the Chinese uh, Buddhist temples that I've been to here in town are Chinese Buddhist, right? So the, they're often ethnically oriented by language group, of course, because uh, the way the worship will be there. Uh, but they're also a mixture of Confucianism, which isn't quite a religion, uh, but also Taoism. And so in that sense that there's a quite of a mixture there. But uh, so China is a harder one to categorize. And so since it's a, more of a mix. So here, just to give some numbers to this then, right? So as I told you all that I'm an accountant, so spreadsheets are my love language. Uh, you know, the numbers here uh, make more as much sense to me as looking at that map, right? But the, the interesting and I think the important thing for us is like, of course, is uh, bragging rights or whatever we have as Christians, but Christianity is the only truly global religion in this sense that we're evenly distributed between the different continental areas. Uh, all the others, uh, particularly Hinduism and Buddhism, as you'll see, are, are isolated there in Asia, but then um, Islam there is more widespread, but it is still geographically uh, much more limited. And so in that sense, like, uh, you know, there's all different reasons for that, right? Colonialism is a reason, so it's not just missionary efforts, but uh, the other side of this is that uh, there was an article a few years back about when Protestant nation, Protestant countries colonized somewhere, the missionaries went there, uh, those countries were more likely to end up with a, a democracy than if other uh, non-Protestant groups were colonized there. So uh, not always a great means to the end, but sometimes good things happen out of that, I would say. So uh, just in case you were interested in that. So our task here today, though, are these Eastern religions, Buddhism and Hinduism. And so what I'm going to give you first is what's kind of the common thread that holds uh, these two groups together. And then uh, spell out uh, Hinduism first and then Buddhism specifically there. So there's four elements here that I see that hold these together, and that cyclical existence. Uh, the, the Sanskrit term is samsara here. Uh, so we tend to think of the idea of rebirth, reincarnation, as like it's a do-over. You know, my kids, they play uh, uh, these games on the Xbox and PlayStation. It's like, well, who cares if I die because I've got another chance, right? I've got another life in the, in the box there. Well, the whole idea of... Uh, these traditions is that uh, samsara, this cyclical existence, actually is the basis, the problem. It, it, you want to get out of this cycle. Um, and so in this sense that rebirth, reincarnation is not, not a good thing. Um, but it is a, uh, an option. I mean, it, it does uh, have that sense of like you're playing the long-term game here rather than just maximizing everything that you would get out of this life, per se. And so, of course, that depends on, uh, when we talk about rebirth, reincarnation, uh, where you're reborn or, or what st status. So are you in a priestly family or not? Uh, these kind of things matter. Your, your birth matters, right? And so this is why it's so hard for us as Westerners to, to think about this, particularly as Americans, because the whole idea of, like, you can come and do anything. Doesn't matter what your parents did, right? Our whole we live off of this, at least this uh, idea that you can transform your whole situation, no matter what your family is. And the whole idea of this rebirth model is is that no, you were reborn in that stage, so not necessarily economically, but spiritually, communally, and so you don't have that pressure to extend beyond it. It's you should live the best within that community at that level. So it's very difficult for us as uh, modern Westerners to uh, understand that. So what, what goes into this then, right, is this moral cause and effect. There's this order that runs things. And so we see um, this is a little bit easier for us. You know, what goes around comes around, I guess, is what we would say here. Uh, if you listen to those within these traditions, karma is like planting seeds. So if you plant weeds, you know, seeds of weeds, then weeds will grow in your yard. 
right? Or if you plant trees, these other things. Like, and so it's not like just a one-for-one one return, but it is more of accumulation that as you do good things. And so they don't really talk in terms of grace because it's more like an accounting charter, right? You're, uh, you just need to do enough good things to outweigh the bad things. It's not like that there's grace that comes in and wipes out the bad stuff. Uh, it's that you as the moral agent. So there's a lot of uh, responsibility laid on individual people within this. Now, and this is one reason why I think Buddhism and uh, particularly mindfulness and other things like this have gotten a ground in the, the West because we like are very individualistic. So you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of idea. But the issue there is that when you think of, if you look at population centers in Asia, you never go anywhere where you're not surrounded by thousands and millions of people. And so even though it has a much more individualist uh, conception to it, it's socially embodied in a very specific way in, in Asia that when Buddhism and other forms of this come to the West, that we... Uh, inhabit them much differently than what Buddhism will look like, for instance, uh, in the East. The, there is this universal moral order then that sets this, uh, the nature of karma. It's not necessarily set by God, so when we think of moral order, we think of uh, God setting out, like these are these principles that God has said are righteous and these things are unrighteous. Uh, it's just baked into the system. And so Dharma... Uh, I should say this as well, like if you're looking at the Sanskrit, so the older version of this uh, language, it'll have R's in it. When you look at Buddhist pronunciation of these terms, they often take out the R's. So they'll say Dhamma instead of Dharma, right? And so it's like the difference between, say, Spanish and Portuguese or, you know, these different Romance languages that are similar, but they're pronounced a little bit different. So I'm just going with the, the simple kind of more traditional one. Uh, and plus, you probably all watched Lost anyway, right? So the Dharma Initiative, right? This, uh, what if, and you know, it's a big question: Was that a, a, an Eastern show, or is there just a weird show? I don't know. But it's, uh, but the whole idea here then is that there's this order, right? And there's balance and harmony and all that that goes into it. Um, what as I translate this to people, or as I was thinking about this, it seems to me like Christ as the Logos. Uh, you might hear the word logos is the modern Greek pronunciation of this, but it's the word word. Uh, and so we get this in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And so for us, like this is, Jesus is the word. He communicates, he reveals God to us. Very important to that. Um, in, in an ancient Greek setting, logos does mean word for sure, but it also has this idea of a principle the orienting principle. And so you'll see early Christians talk about that the world is logikos, is rational, because Christ is the logos, the principle who pervades everything. So Christ himself as the creator, as the principle that participates in Christ uh, throughout creation then as the logos. And so I think it's much, it's that kind of sense here. Of course, they're not think, think of this in personal terms uh, because so much here, uh, this divine reality uh, is very much said in a non-personal way. It is a, the moral order that has always existed. There is no time that we know that there was a Big Bang or anything like that in that sense. Like it, it has always existed. And that's why the wheel here is quite important. So uh, as you'll perhaps know, that's the Indian flag uh, there on the top, right? And what we have on our flags communicates, I think, central uh, issues and identities for us. Uh, and so to have that wheel, right, right there at the center of what to means to be Indian then is part of this moral order, this cyclical nature that pervades and drives everything that happens. And then the bottom one is uh, the Buddhist uh, version of this. We'll get to the eightfold path is why there are eight spokes on this wheel. But it's still cent centered around this cyclical nature there. And then, of course, both of these traditions have this idea that this idea of rebirth is not a good thing. 
it's cyclical, um, and how long it takes. So let me say this. There's a, a statement by the, the Buddha that says that the four oceans as they knew them in and around uh, South Asia, uh, you will cry more tears in all your rebirths than all the waters in those four oceans. Right? And so they're, they're not talking about like this is a five, 10, 20, thousand, even a million rebirths, right? This is a timeless cycle here uh, that we've caught up. And of course, the, the inherent to this cycle is suffering, right? As we come and talk about these different traditions. And so the release from suffering is at the heart of this. Uh, and again, it's not a savior religion like we have, so a rescue religion. It's one where you finally spin out of this by separating yourself from it, detaching from it. Uh, in Hinduism, that term is moksha, and in, we're familiar more often with the Buddhist term nirvana, but they both mean functionally the same thing. So as we talk about uh, Hinduism then within this model, the, the main fundamental difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is that there is a divine reality. There is um, a, a supreme being, we might say, a, a god. Of course, so this is a huge debate. And uh, Hindu thought is like, are Hindus monotheists? Are they polytheists or just kind of pantheists? Some other version of this, because there is this sense that there is one unifying divine reality called Brahman. Um, but it's not a personal God in the way that we think of God, right? It's much more of that kind of pantheistic uh, view if, in, in our sense that would uh, help us understand this, that God pervades everything. And so that we, as having our own self-identity, so the, the term here is your Atman, that each one of us has an Atman. And philosophical Hinduism will say has a key premise that Atman is Brahman, and Brahman is Atman, that we are fundamentally a part of uh, this singular divine reality. So we have an individual self, but really we are just part of this. Um, I don't think I, it, it's hard to uh, conceive of this because we're very individualistic in the way uh, we conceive of things. In fact, most of the dystopian movies about 10 or 15 years ago really played this up. Anytime society pushed you into a corner, your job was to break outside of that. So the Hunger Games kind of has this, right? You have these different communities that uh, separate you, and of course the whole idea is to break outside of those. There's the movie The Giver. Um, maybe if you're uh, of my generation, you watched a lot of Land Before Time movies when I, my kids were growing up, right? These dinosaur movies, right? But the whole idea was like society, the grandparents told them not to do anything. But the best way that you could be you was these little kids to go off and have their adventures, not by listening to what, you know. Um, and so we wonder why our kids don't obey us is because we discipled them on these movies for there are 20 different versions of this Land Before Time thing that my kids watch. But um, so it's very hard for us to, uh, to conceptualize ourselves as really our identity is not separate from this. Uh, Hermann Hesse is a, a German author, and he wrote a book uh, uh, called Siddhartha. And it was um, like usually high literature I struggle to appreciate, but this was a very accessible story. And it's about the Buddha, but it, it captures this idea in a way. And it's this whole thing that uh, the Buddha, Siddhartha, uh, is the Buddha. And so that he goes and he lives by a river in this jungle. And really everything is in this river. And when you think about this sense of like where you are in the river, you're still in the river. And you're a part of the river. And you're drawn into it. And, and it's that mindset that you are a part of this. And so you have to play your role, right? So part of Hinduism is that and this is distinct from Buddhism, is that you're really given this distinct uh, role within that system. And so that's where the caste system comes in. Uh, formerly, the caste system by the state of India was abolished, but functionally, it still uh, enacts itself. Um, as I mentioned before, your, your religion is on your, pa your passport, your birth certificate, or uh, your official papers in India. And so 
you, you know, in this sense, like religion plays a key part to even if some of these more uh, general parts that we talk about that. So as we think about, though, uh, this divine reality, uh, we the term that's used there are avatars or incarnations, you'll see that, of this divine reality through the different gods that you'll see. And so there is a more philosophical Hinduism, which we would call the uh, the, the jhana yoga there, the path of wisdom. This is the, the, the more monastic philosophical version of Hinduism. But the bhakti yoga, this way of devotion, is like, how do you engage God? It's through worshiping and particularly devoting yourself to a particular incarnation of this divine reality. And so in that sense, uh, you know, if you follow Krishna or Vishnu, or Shiva, and then, of course, there's all these other millions of other iterations because oftentimes, like, so Krishna is the kind of the main title for one of these gods, but he, ha he comes in different incarnations and will show up. So think of, for instance, like if you remember uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey, right, these gods will come and, and show up at different times and participate in the story. Well, they may come in a different identity at different times. So Rama is also a, a name for Krishna. And so your devotion then to one of these gods or multiple ones is your path of being a good Hindu. And so this, this is what the average person does, right? I mean, so you, we, we have this same kind of division uh, in Christianity. We either in high church traditions have monks, nuns, people that devote themselves to that. But the average person is not a seminary professor or scholar. Uh, right, we worship, and this is the heart of what it means to be Christian, and so that's what this is the way that most Hindus uh, participate in Hinduism. And this, so this sense, let me give you a sense of like, so you're devoting yourself to one God is the main idea. In America, we think in terms of political parties, like whatever your persuasion is, to be the best American, sometimes it's conceived that the best way to be American is Republican. Or some people say the best way for me to be American is to be a Democrat, right? So you're devoting yourself to this party, but through that party, you think it's really the way to get to the ideal form of being uh, an American. And so I think that maybe will help you understand a little bit about devoting yourself to these. But the whole idea is that really, in the philosophical version of this, behind Krishna is just this one divine principle. So the whole idea is that you're not really limited to this. And then the karma yoga is the just be a good person. All, all three of these versions are in the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of this longer epic poem called the Mahabharata. Um, they say it's the longest epic poem in the, in the world. Uh, but it's a narrative. And so part of the narrative is this uh, question. There's a there's a caste system, and the guy in the second level of the caste system, he's a warrior leader, he's like, I shouldn't be killing people because that seems like a bad thing. And so he has this whole um, interchange with Krishna as a part of this, and he's like, no. Krishna says, no, you were given this status in life, and so your purpose is to fulfill this. And so if you had to kill people to do that, it's okay, one, because there's rebirth and reincarnation. It's not like you're hindering them from something, right? Because, again, you got a million tries at this, right? It's not the ten tries or whatever that you got with Super Mario Brothers. Um, you know, so in that sense, you have to think about it in the long term, but it's also much more about what was your task that was given to you, and you need to fulfill that within the community. And so that is. Um, Inherent, that's one of the main things there in the Gita. If you, uh, I don't know if any of y'all been down to Stafford. Um, I know it's a little bit further south of town uh, than here, but one of the, there's this series of Hindu temples around uh, the U.S. called BAPS, and B-A-P-S uh, stands for a very long uh, title that I can't uh, pronounce, but this is, uh, there's a Hindu temple down there. It's one of the larger ones in the United States. Uh, you can go visit there. Uh, what will happen at that is some prayers and chanting. Um, and then one of the main things are to 
do what's called the Murti uh, Darshan. So Murti uh, would basically what we would think of as an idol, as an image, a statue of one of the gods, and Darshan is viewing it. And so this is very important in Hindu religion. It's like if you, and, and it reflects maybe we don't have as much as this in our theology today, but historically the idea of a beatific vision. So if you remember Dante, he has uh, three different books in his trilogy, one about um, Inferno, Purgatorio, and then Paradiso. But the whole idea of Paradiso, paradise, heaven, is to see God to have that divine, that beatific vision. So beatific has to do with the blessing. Well, the word beatitude. The beatitudes are blessed are those. And so by seeing God, we are blessed, we're transformed in that. And so there's a, a more limited version of that here. In fact, I watched this documentary of one of the largest uh, Hindu temples. It's in South India. They, they have 80 to 100,000 people a day that come to see um, the statues there. And yet the statues are within this whole complex. And so you will you might only get to see that statue for two, three seconds because it's kind of down this hallway and the average person's not allowed in there. But the whole thing, you'll spend the whole day there because it, of course there are more than just seeing that. But that is the climax of the experience is this darshan, being able to see the idol and experience that. Uh, one of the other ways is, has to do with, uh, you'll often see, is pouring milk or water on top of uh, things as well. Uh, and so uh, there's plenty more in Hinduism. So this is the whole thing. It's like uh, we talked about before, or I talked about last time, I believe, uh, your experience of th something might be, my experience of England was quite different than my wife's experience of England. And, of course, we lived in the same town. We lived in the same house. But I went to the university that was full of people that had studied at Oxford and Cambridge and were now teaching at Durham. And she worked at a local supermarket. And with uh, later on in our church, we're doing outreach with people that lived in that village and had never even been to Scotland that was an hour and a half away. And so... Our two experiences of the same reality were quite different. And so when you engage Hinduism, there are some very common realities. Uh, but depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, your experience can be quite different. right? And so that's part of... Uh, so this is a version that is here in Houston. Uh, so particularly Southeast Asia, uh, of course, uh, Zen Buddhism and Japan, things like this are important as well. And it comes from the Buddha. Uh, so this is important. Buddha is not his name. Uh, in the same way that Christ actually is not Jesus' name, right? It's not Jesus, Joseph and Mary Christ that had a little baby Jesus Christ, right? Christ is a title. It means the Messiah. That's, uh, so when you have a baptism, and we also call it a christening, it's because we put oil on the baby's head they become uh, little Christ. They have been anointed with oil, and so they have been christened. Um, and so Christ then is a title. Um, in, in functional terms, in modern English, I would say the word Christ is best associated with the idea of being a king. And we see this because Jesus is uh, crucified for being the king of the Jews, right? And his whole ministry is about the kingdom of God. And so in that sense, that king is probably our best understanding of that. So when we come to Buddhism here and the Buddha, this is not his name. It's a, it's a title like Christ is. He is the enlightened one. He is the one who has become awakened and understands what this cycle of samsara is and how do we escape that. And so with that, then... Uh, his story, just a background here, was he was raised as a prince in a royal family and so was isolated, uh, as the story goes, from all suffering, anything that went on. Everything was great and happy for him. And at some point, he decided to travel outside of the castle or his home area, whatever. I guess probably wasn't a castle. but uh, uh, And he saw somebody sick for the first time. And then he saw somebody 
at dying and somebody that had, was in old age. And so these were a shock to him that like this, the what I understood of the world is not what I thought it was. And so how do I make sense of these things that are mo more so pervasive? And so uh, he goes on this spiritual journey for several years. Uh, is an ascetic, ascetic monk, so that means he, uh, you know, did the things of like the extreme fasting, all this stuff, and then decided actually that creates as much suffering as uh, other forms. And so Buddhism, by and large, um, calls itself the middle way. Right? You don't live lasciviously, uh, but you don't live in extreme asceticism either. Uh, at least on the monastic side. Uh, the, the big difference between Buddhism and Hinduism is that Buddhism technically says there is no God. There is no divine reality. There is no Brahman. And so in this sense, there is this divine Dharma that pervades this moral order, but it's not a sense that there is a divine being in any way that undergirds that. It's just what it is, what is. And so in this sense, Buddhism has found an interesting home, a hook in modern Western culture but with our scientism and our, our view of what scholars call disenchantment. We used to live according to a system of enchantment, so not uh, magic per se, but of angels and demons, spirits, even God being active in the world. And the modern Westerner lives with a disenchanted worldview. God is not active have what's called a theist view of God, or we have become atheistic. There is no God, there is no, and so everything is a material reality. And so in that sense, Buddhism can map into that disenchanted kind of perspective here is that there is, <clears throat> or at least some element of Buddhism. The interesting thing is, is just because there is no singular divine reality doesn't mean there isn't spiritual realities. So we are, in a way, kind of spiritual people, we're engaged in this kind of karmic order that uh, is around us. And so there are people that are in different layers. And so instead of focusing like Hinduism is on the caste system to map that out, they focus more strongly on your kind of order in reality. So you might be reborn into a version of hell as part of uh, this, but that you're not limited there for the rest of your life, right? So the, you live your life in that well, and then you kind of can cycle out um, in the same way. So there's the animal kingdom, there's the human kingdom, but there's actually a spiritual reality of what we would call kind of uh, demigods or gods even, in the sense that they live in this spiritual reality. But it's not like you go there and you become... Um, that, that's not your final state to live in this heavenly reality because that's just one of the layers of reality that exists. Those people can cycle back down if they don't live well there. And so they too, all of us then, are seeking this ultimate release of nirvana. One of the things that they talk about that's sometimes hard to process for us is this no-self. So if Atman is the self in Hinduism, uh, you'll sometimes hear this on Atman, the, the no-self aspect of Buddhism. And it's not so much that there is no individual reality, but that there is no stable individual reality. Everything about us is constantly changing. Our bodies are changing. The way we perceive things are changing. And so there is no stable you. And so part of this is pointing to there's just this sif always changing. So an example, a Buddhist monk that I've talked with once, use the language of a candle. A candle is never in a static state, right? It's always burning through the wax, the wick, and yet when it runs down, what do you do? You lean it over and you light another candle. And so it's always in. So is the flame the same flame? Yeah, there's some sense of continuity there, but actually the whole thing is always in this constant state of flux and change. And so that's what forms us. So for, um, I'll uh, move here because I can speak more to what the, the Four Noble Truths would be held by all Buddhists here in the sense that, that there is suffering, there is imbalance in the world, the, the term they use is dukkha. And so it's that constant state of flux, of change, 
um, is surrounding us. And so it creates suffering. And what creates that suffering or imbalance is our, our constant desire for more, craving. And so our attachment to things. And if we really are a no self, then that means that we shouldn't attach to any point in that cycle, right? Because if, if the reality is constant change, if you try to grab onto this, well, everything is going to keep moving, right? And so you're grasping for something that's never going to exist. Um, and even good things, we think about this. So uh, this monk that was, I was talking to, he, um, he was saying, like, you know, you can go eat somewhere and you might have experience of bad food and we know that's suffering right that's not a good thing but even if you have a good meal one of the things you're like in the meal you're thinking well if i'm eating you know my fajitas here wherever it is i'm waiting for you know the dessert at the end so you're you're always looking ahead to something else because you're never quite satisfied with this or if you have this meal when you're done like you have this sense of like oh you know suffering because you 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 miss what has it's not there anymore, you know, and so there's always this sense of dissatisfaction, of imbalance here. And so the way that we get out of this then is through detaching, right? Really accepting that there is no permanent self. So whatever happens to me, to this body, that's not my permanent self. So if something bad happens, um, you know, that I, I should detach from that, right? And so there are ways then to pursue that, and that's through the Eightfold Path. And part of that is like living, having a positive karma, right? So that is one of the major ways that you, and so you have all these right view and speech and conduct, but then to ultimately find this release, what they would call nirvana, is through totally detaching from that. And that's why meditation then, is kind of the climax of, of Buddhist practice. Now, the average Buddhist does not meditate, right? Uh, and this is the only, that's for the monks to do. Now, there are two kind of forms of Buddhism um, that we uh, skipped over that, but the Theravada Buddhists are kind of the old school Buddhists, right? They're like the, uh, the, the Anglo Catholic. Right, you know, it's like you have the high church people. It doesn't quite fall out high church, low church, but they they really say like to go to nirvana, you've got to be a, a monk. And so if you weren't a monk, you're not called to be a monk. Your purpose is to su support the monks now. That's how you build karma. And then when you become a monk, then you can cycle out of this. The Mahayana Buddhists are more. Uh, they're called the large vehicle, that they have a, a broader scope. Maybe they're the low church Protestant version of this. It's like everybody is ha, is called to be a priest, you know, and so that everybody has this role to play in that. And so they don't just emphasize the Buddha, but also these bodhisattvas, these other people that have become enlightened as well and help train and lead us. And so if you go to a, a Buddhist temple, uh, this is from inside the temple that is uh, around the corner from HBU. Um, it's full of these statues. It, it functionally looks very similar to a Hindu temple. And so you're like, what in the world? If there is no self, if there's just meditation, what's going on here? Well, at, you know, the reality of engaging beauty and all these other things are, are uh, central to Buddhist practice. And so you'll go and pray for these other, what, in, in sense, like in the Catholic tradition, you have saints that you invoke to help you, right? That's functionally what is happening here is that other, those that have gone before are both models and even they have spiritual power that can help you in your own karmic path. So a lot of incense, a lot of individual prayer, uh, things like that. So just a couple of quick things as we end here about East meets West. Buddhism in America looks very different than this, <laughs> right? The mindfulness movement that we have, uh, it, the way that it's inhabited or taken in uh, American mindfulness is very distinct from what 99% of Buddhists, right, actually inhabit in Eastern countries. Because it is not just the sense of mindfulness, 
for us, but it's a sense of the whole community participating in this and celebrating that. The same question there that arises with mindfulness is also the same question with yoga. And you'll have Christians that are nervous about both of these practices, right? Because are they the halfway house to get us there? Um, I, I am not super worried about either because I don't think that most average Americans are going to participate in this. <laughs> but it is, uh, there are wider issues there. Um, I spoke about how science and Buddhism, right? There is an inherent uh, interest in Buddhism because it has this non-religious, or it, you can be spiritual without being religious, maybe is the right way to say it, right? And that, that strikes a strong chord with many Americans. And so that you, somebody proposed this idea. If you had a Tibetan monk come to the American Psychological Association and the primary academic, very rigorous setting to come give a talk on mindfulness and meditation, probably welcomed in, wearing a robe, shaved head, and they're very secular, right? If you had a Christian Jesuit priest come in and talk about focusing on Jesus and the he'd be run off, right? Because, it, you know, he's, but both are talking about forms of mindfulness and prayer, but Buddhism is accepted by American academic and scientific kind of culture in a way that Christianity is not. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, but uh, there's one of the things there. And I'll leave it with this. One of the, the things that drives these systems is karma. You are responsible ultimately for fixing your own problem, right? And in Christianity, we call that Pelagianism. It's one of the earliest kind of heresies that you can pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross if we could just fix ourselves, right? And so Christianity is, even though we might have these practices that, uh, you know, and of course Christianity has lots of things, with centering prayer and other monastic prayer uh, things that um, are, I think are very healthy and appropriate for us. But at the same time, we also just like, there's a fundamental, like at the very core of the system of Christianity in these Eastern religions is different. And so it's not so much on the practices, but it's on this idea of karma that you fix yourself and you're responsible for fixing yourself. So there's a lot of weight on the individual person to get it right over against uh, the idea of grace. So I'll uh, open it up for questions here. One thing before we leave, if you enjoy like this kind of teaching that's more kind of an academic level or things like that, we at HBU have opened up our grad program classes to have people come and survey or audits the, uh, the older term for that, but uh, you don't actually register in the system and all that kind of stuff, but uh, fully in the way you would with an audit. So you're welcome to come join us there. Um, we'll put that plug in there. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the book that I do with Engaging Theology is focused on Christian theology, but in each chapter as we talk about, say, the Holy Spirit, how do these other religions that we've talked about here engage and practice, or the idea of what makes us human, or the idea of salvation. And so if you want to see how these inter interrelate at more at that level, um, I would point to that. But what questions might I answer about Hinduism or Buddhism or world religion as a whole. Yeah, how does the caste system function, I guess, is it that in that sense? Yeah, or? Yeah, it makes me feel like, oh, I'm really using that one. Is there any... Yeah, so I think the whole idea is that you do what's right for you and your station. So you don't get out of your lane. You know, so for us, like if you're uh, a role at work, you know, you don't try to do somebody else's job, right? So you're hired to do this, you know, so you're born in this level. Uh, and you were specifically born at that level because you did something, right? It's not, you know, I can't blame anybody else. So it's right for us to treat you this way. And so, of course, for Christianity to come and treat the lowest caste or the outcast the same as the high caste. Now, does this always happen? No. I mean, right, because Christians, we, 
live according to the social and economic factors as well. We let that drive us. But in our ethic is, is that we treat both the same. And that's very countercultural, right? And so if you look at Mother Teresa, then her ministry in Calcutta, right? Why was it so impactful? Is because she's living at total odds to what the system that runs their society is. Is there a hand back here? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Okay, so the question is how to find the best version of the Quran to read then? Yeah. Um, so what, what I look for is often the academic presses. Uh, so like uh, the version I have is published by Oxford Academic Press or Oxford University Press. And so like if you go there, that the, the whole idea of academic scholarship is kind of the arm's length transaction with something. So not trying to sell it from within the religion, but you're looking, taking that. And so they tend to give you, uh, there, there's actually a recent uh, Quran translation that came out, that, an annotated Quran. So like we have the NIV study Bible you know, or these that have the footnotes that explain things. Uh, there's a version of that that has just been published, uh, which is quite helpful to situate historically or like it references there, particularly for the non-specialists, if we're gonna read something to have a sense of that. Uh, we didn't, if you, uh, since my PowerPoint slides didn't come up last week, there is a center for Muslim and Christian studies here in Houston. Uh, there's a couple, they're uh, British, um, that had moved here from Oxford. And so we've done some things there. They're uh, participating with Rice as well. Uh, but if you're interested in Islamic um, discussions and things, uh, I would encourage you to, to just Google that. It's the Center for Christian Muslim Studies here in Houston. I Ida Glazer is who directs that. Uh, see a hand over here, yeah. Yeah, back in the 70s, I used to, in any of the airports in Houston. Mm. Uh, I would encounter Hare Krishnas. Yes. Yeah, so in that sense, that's part of the... Yeah, that's true. I haven't thought about... So Krishna goes back to their devotees of Krishna or Vishnu, uh, one of the gods there. Yeah, but they were monks. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, it's funny, in my contemporary kind of things, I haven't heard anybody talk about them recently, so I'm not sure if it, you know, it's like other kind of just movements that come and go. I mean, my suspicion there is somebody had bankrolled that, right? You know, or right, and so I mean, this is and this is the same thing for us. Like things that have resources behind them, have some, yeah, um, money and and energy to it. And if if you lose that, then you know, it takes a lot of time and energy to go stand at the airport. You know, yeah, yeah. Mm. So yes. Billions now, and so are there new? Yeah, I, I actually uh, was listening to a series of lectures, and this was posed to the the monk that was giving the lectures, and um, you know he his sense was that there were, anyhow, there's all sorts of things you could wrap into that because if all animals, right, are also part of these spiritual realities, like as animal species die off happens concurrently, I mean, there's all these weird kind of ways that you can measure that out. But, um, you know, if you just think about the millions and billions of insects there are, much less people, like the human population growth is very negligible relative to the amount of total kind of animal life, I guess is what we would say. And, um, but it did, uh, he, he was basically like, there's almost an infinite number of people. And so for us to talk about one balance or imbalance, it's hard for, uh, and particularly the Buddha never commented on those things, you know? So it, it's like modern Christians trying to talk about uh, cloning or genetic ma manipulation, right? Nobody in the Bible ever even conceived that any of these questions would happen, and so we, we have to come up with different modes to even conceive of what goes into that. 
All right, got, uh, actually I see that I'm at time, so I'm gonna give uh, end here. And so I appreciate uh, your attention. And if you ever have any personal questions, i uh, very happy to answer emails or uh, have a, a lunch or a call or anything if you uh, are interested. So just you can Google me, uh, Ben Blackwell there at HBU. So thank you all very much.